Okay. Hello and welcome to our webinar today on storytelling with data visualizing philanthropy. My name is Stephanie Gerding and I'm the training and outreach coordinator with TechSoup for Libraries. I'm also the producer of today's session and joining me today is our presenter Cole Nussbaumer and TechSoup webinar manager Kyla Hunt who's helping us today with chat. So welcome everyone and Cole if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself today. Great. Can you hear me, Stephanie? Yeah, it's a little low, so if you can just speak up a little bit, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Cole, and I tell stories with data. My day job's at Google, where I work on a team called People Analytics, and we're an analytics team within the Human Resources organization at Google. And our goal is to ensure that people decisions at Google, those made about our employees or our future employees, are data driven. So I often find myself in the situation where I need to convince someone to do something using data. And over time, I researched and learned best practices for doing this. One day I thought, I should share this. So I developed a class at Google that I teach on data visualization. Then I thought, why stop there? Organizations around the world can benefit from being able to tell a compelling visual story with data. So I've partnered with organizations like the Grant Managers Network here in the States and the European Foundation Center and TechSoup on sessions like the one today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cole. We're so happy to have you here with us today. It's definitely important to foundations now more than ever to really be able to tell our stories and using visual ways to do that can definitely help us show our impact as well. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the presentation, Cole. All right, are you seeing my screen now, Stephanie? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So with that, let's get going. Philanthropy. You all work in this world, and I have to imagine you got into it because of some internal passion for wanting to drive change, wanting to make something better, and that's what you do. But how do you prove that you and your organization are doing good or that you're having an impact? One way to do so is with data. But I don't mean put some data into Excel, select insert chart, and you're done. That's not going to create a compelling case no matter how compelling your underlying numbers are. Rather, today we're going to talk about using data to tell a story. So first off, we're going to talk about choosing the right type of display. So typically, when you have data that you want to show, the first thing that most people think of is a table or a graph. But before we get there, I want us to talk for a moment about simple text. Um, if you have just one or a couple of numbers that you want to highlight, uh, as in the example here, right, 228 grants awarded, 16.8 million pounds total value, putting those in a table or in a graph actually causes them to lose some of their, um, some of their oomph. Um, so don't shy away from text if you have one or just a couple of numbers that you want to show. It can be a really powerful way to get that information across. When you do have more data that you want to show, typically a table or a graph is what you'll use. I'm going to talk for a moment uh, about some of the use cases for each of those. Tables are great at, um, if you have an audience who each is going to want to look at their specific piece, um, they can be very useful if you have multiple different uh, dimensions or units of measure that's sometimes hard in a graph. And the thing to understand with tables is that people read them. Um, they interact with our verbal system, um, and, and they take some computational power to understand, right? Because the, the person is um, physically reading the information in the table and then digesting it. Graphs, on the other hand, are interpreted by our visual system, which means that when there's done well, there's this kind of visual aha moment that happens um, pretty quickly, um, more quickly than information than in a table comes across. Um, there are a bunch of different types of graphs, right? We'll look at a couple here. This is a picture of a scatter plot. 
which is useful for graphing information on both an x and a y axis at the same time. Line graphs, typically your x axis, that horizontal axis on the line graph should be some measure of time. And that's because the points are physically connected in a line graph. There's this connection that, um, that, that, that comes across with the data. So you want to make sure you're only plotting continuous data when you're using a line graph. When you have categorical data, a bar chart is usually going to be your best bet. Bar charts are great because they are very easy for people to read. So what our eyes are actually doing when we're looking at a bar chart is comparing the endpoints of the bars. And that's actually an easy visual um, comparison for our eyes to make. Um, so the nice thing about bar charts is that people already know how to read them, which means less of a learning curve when you're pre presenting information in a bar chart to an audience. Now there are different types of bar charts. This is your kind of standard vertical bar chart. Also horizontal bar charts. Uh, a good use case for a horizontal bar chart is if your category names are very long. Um, because of the way it's oriented, you can orient your descriptions, your axis labels, from left to right as most people read. There are also stacked bar charts, and stacked bar charts can be useful if you're comparing totals across different categories, and then within a given category, you want to have some idea of the um, individual breakdown. They're less useful if you want to compare sub-segments across categories, because once you get past that first series, you no longer have a consistent baseline to use to compare. So you just want to be careful about that when you're using stacked bar charts. Area charts are another type of graph, specifically pie charts. Um, and to talk a little bit more about these, I want to look at a specific example. So here's a pie chart. We're looking at total Greek and international commitments from 1996 to October of 2011. And I want you to look at this chart for a moment and look specifically at the green segment on the bottom right and estimate in your head how big you think that segment is. What percentage of the total pie do you think it makes up? And so when I look at that, I, you know, it looks like it's, it's a bit more than a third to me, so I'd guess like you know, maybe somewhere between 35, maybe even 40 percent. But check out what happens when we put the actual numbers on there. So it's actually less than a third. The blue slice uh, at the top is bigger, um, but it doesn't appear that way to us. And that's because of a couple reasons. Um, first off, our eyes have a really hard time associating quantitative value with two-dimensional space. And what that means more simply is that pie charts are really hard for people to read. In this case, we have the added dimension of 3D, um, which obscures things, um, you know, makes some things appear bigger than they are, other things appear smaller. So you typically want to stay away from 3D when you're plotting data because it introduces noise and actually makes the data harder to read. So if we were to make some changes to this, we could look at something like what we have here now. So we've flattened the pie chart, we've taken out the 3D, also stripped out the color that didn't make, uh, did, wasn't adding any informative value. Um, we have everything labeled specifically, so it's very clear uh, how much each slice of the pie accounts for. We've also organized the slices, starting at the top left, from greatest to least as you go around the pie in clockwise fashion. Um, this still isn't an ideal visual for me. I think if you were wanting to use a pie chart, this is an okay pie chart. But I'd like to encourage you to think about visuals outside of pie charts, just given their difficulty in, um, in reading. Here's another way to picture the same data. So in this case, we've turned it into a horizontal bar chart. Again, we've ordered it from greatest to least, making it very clear kind of what the visual comparison is. And with a bar chart, we're able to see not only the absolute value of each piece, but also how incrementally larger or smaller it is compared to the other pieces of the pie. One thing you lose with this is this idea of there being pieces of a whole and, and a whole. Um, so we've tried to deal with that here by showing that the pieces sum to 100%.
that's one way to tackle it. So that was a bit on different types of graphs. Now I want to shift gears and talk about eliminating clutter. So I want to talk a bit about the Gestalt principles of visual perception. The Gestalt School of Psychology set out in 1912 to uncover how we perceive pattern, form, and organization in what we see. The result of their research was the Gestalt principles of perception, which are still respected today as accurate descriptions of visual behavior. These principles reveal attributes that incline us to group objects that we see in particular ways. Many of these are relevant in our interest in the design of tables and graphs, as well as the overall design of the report that contains them. The first principle is proximity. We perceive objects that are close together to each other as belonging to a group. Check out how this can be used effectively in tables. So here, simply by virtue of differentiating the spacing between the dots, our eyes are drawn either across the rows in the first case or down the columns in the second case. Second principle is similarity. We tend to group objects that are similar in color, size, shape, orientation. Again, we can use this to help our audience direct their eyes when they read our table. The third principle is enclosure. We perceive objects as belonging together when they're enclosed by anything, a line, a common color. This principle can be applied in the use of borders and fill colors in tables and graphs and to group information or to set it apart. Um, so here, for example, we've drawn attention to this upper right-hand piece of the graph through enclosure. And note that it doesn't take a very strong enclosure to create a strong perception of grouping. The next uh, principle is closure. People tend to dislike loose ends. When faced with ambiguous visual stimuli, uh, objects that could be perceived to be either open, incomplete, and uh, unusual forms, or as closed, whole, regular forms, we naturally perceive them as the latter. We perceive open structures as closed, complete, and regular whenever there's a way we can reasonably interpret them as such. Um, so here, most people see, rather than two opposing objects, they see a square with the center missing, or a circle with a piece missing. And this knowledge can be used in the design of tables and graphs. For example, we can group objects, individual regions, without the use of complete borders to define the space. Think subtle x and y axes rather than heavy border and fill. Next principle is continuity. This one's similar to closure. It says, if I take the objects in the first pane and pull them apart, most people would expect to see what's shown in the second pane, whereas it could just as easily be what's in the third. And again, this one of the things that the Gestalt principles help us do is identify things that don't need to be in our graphs, that are adding clutter, and allow us to strip them away. So here in this example at the top, we've actually stripped out the y-axis, but we didn't lose any informative value. The final principle is connection. We perceive objects that are connected as part of the same group, and connection exercises greater power over our visual perception than proximity or similarity, but typically less than enclosure. And one of the ways we can use a connective property is in line graphs. So what I'd like to do now is look at an example so you can see some of these principles applied in the real world. So this is a graph, uh, a line graph. It's plotting how people receive their news. Um, this was um, the data from a survey that asked people just that. Um, and people could answer more than one response. Um, so the sum of these adds up to more than 100%. So you can see um, you know, the television, newspaper, internet, and radio uh, over time. So let's start stripping things away that may not need to be here. So first we can take out the grid lines. And note just in doing that how much more our data stands out. We can take away the border. We can take away the point markers. Um, in this last step, I took away some of the uh, x-axis labels so that it wasn't so cluttered. We can label our series directly. So remember, this is the Gestalt principle of proximity. It makes it much easier than having to look back and forth between a graph and a legend. 
here now I've put the labels on the left. Um, most Western cultures, people read left to right, top to bottom. So by putting the labels at the left, you ensure that the reader encounters them first. And then we've actually taken the axis away and labeled our endpoints explicitly. So again, leveraging the Gestalt principle of proximity here. So we'll come back to this example um, through our, our next couple of lessons. Uh, and next we'll talk about focusing attention where you want it. So this is a picture of how people see. At the left-hand side, you have light reflecting off a stimulus. That gets captured by our eyes. We don't actually see with our eyes. Rather, our eyes act like little pictures, um, or little cameras, excuse me. They take pictures and pass that information onto our brain where what we actually think of as visual perception takes place. And in our brain, there are a couple of types of memory that are important to um, designing um, graphs and charts. And there's one we're going to talk about today, which is iconic memory. And iconic memory is super short term, shorter than short term memory. Information stays there for fractions of a second before it's forwarded on to your short term memory. And the important thing about iconic memory is that it's tuned to a set of what we call pre-attentive attributes. And to show the power of those, I want to do a quick exercise. So in a moment, I'm going to put a series of numbers up on the screen. And what I'd like you to do, as quickly as humanly possible, is count the number of fives that you see. All right, ready, set, go. All right, so if you came up with six, then you are correct. Uh, however, this was kind of difficult, right? Not technically difficult, but you have to physically read these four rows of text, look for five, which is kind of a complicated shape, but watch what happens if we make just the slightest change. The fives jump off the page at you, right? And this is because we're leveraging a pre-attentive attribute. We're leveraging the pre-attentive attribute of hue or color to make the fives the one thing that stand out from everything else. And this is really powerful because what this means is that if we use pre-attentive attributes well in our visualizations, it can help us enable our audience to see what we want them to see before they even really know they're seeing it. So this is really powerful stuff. This is a list of the different types of pre-attentive attributes. And I won't read through all of these, but note as your eye scans the page how it's just drawn to the one that's different from the rest. You don't really even need to look for it. We can categorize pre-attentive attributes, note that I'm doing so here through the pre-attentive attribute of color, into four categories. In blue, we have pre-attentive attributes of form. In green, pre-attentive attributes of color, spatial position, motion. One thing to understand about pre-attentive attributes is that people tend to associate quantitative values with some, but not others. For example, most people would consider a long line to represent a greater value than a short line. But we don't think of color, for example, in the same way. If I ask you which is greater, red or green, it's not a meaningful question. And this is important because it tells us which pre-attentive attributes can be used to encode quantitative information, and which should be used as categorical differentiators. So to make this real, I want to look at an example. So here's some text on the screen. Um, without any visual cues, we basically have to read through all of this to make the call on what's important and on where we should focus our attention. So let's watch what happens when we start leveraging some pre-attentive attributes in different portions of this. So we can draw the person's eye, our audience's eye, with bold. We can draw it with color, size, uh, enclosure, added marks, so by underlining, spacing. All of these draw our eyes in different ways and to different places. And so you can see how when we use all of these things together or, or use a selection of them, we can create a visual hierarchy of information for our audience. And 
make the page much more scannable, right? Remember in that first version, someone would have had to read all of those lines of text to figure out what was important. Here, there's kind of a five second scan that they can do. They can still read through everything, um, but they don't have to necessarily read through everything to understand what's going on. So that's what we want to try to do with our pre-attentive attributes, is draw our audience's attention where we want it, and also create a visual hierarchy of information. It's basically a way to let the audience into your head as the designer and help them understand where they should focus their attention. So let's look back at our example of how people get their news. So this is where we ended off, and you can see we've got Pre-attentive attributes happening, right, color and such, but, but they're all happening of equal strength. We're not getting a visual hierarchy of information from this. And with pre-attentive attributes, it's usually really minor changes that you have to make um, in, in order to make that really powerful. So let's just look what happens when I strip out the color here um, in all cases but where I want to draw your attention. And that's what we get. So immediately, you're drawn to the internet line, right? It's blue against gray. It's thicker than the other lines. It makes it immediately clear to our audience that that's what they should be paying attention to. So finally, let's talk about using our data to tell a visual story. And stories have words. I think often when people think of data visualization, they, they overlook words. Um, but words can be amazingly helpful at explaining what's happening, at describing, um, and at helping, our, again, our audience know what they should pay attention to. So there's some text that needs to be on every graph. Every graph needs a title. Every axis needs a label. And that's true no matter how obvious you think it is from context, because just the lack of those things being explicitly there on the page allows a bit of space for question in your audience's mind of, you know, I think I'm looking at this, but I'm not totally sure. And so you want to just label explicitly to take that question away so that instead of trying to figure out what they're looking at, your audience is using their brain power to understand the information that's being presented. Um, highlight boxes are great for, uh, or call out boxes are great for highlighting important points. Again, here we're using the Gestalt principle of proximity to make it clear what we're actually talking about. We're using enclosure to help draw kind of attention um, to our box there. And one thing that's important to understand is that somebody else looking at the same data is not necessarily going to come away with the same conclusion. And what this means is if you have a specific conclusion or a specific recommendation that you want your audience to come away with, state that explicitly with text, right? Tell them. Don't make them guess. Uh, so let's go back to our example. Um, again, here's where we left off after we used our pre-attentive attributes. And the final step we need to take is to put a story around it. And we can do that simply, right? It doesn't need to be a big elaborate story. Here we've, we've labeled our graph, or we title our graph, how people get their news, and our subtitle has the story in it. An increasing portion cite the internet as their primary news source. And note that we've colored internet blue, the same as the line is uh, in the graph. This help makes a visual tie. Remember, this is the Gestalt principle of similarity. Um, we've also added our source and some other things to the bottom of the page in a footnote um, that's there to help the audience interpret the information but isn't drawing undue attention to itself. So that's where we end up with this visual. What I'd like to do now is take you through one more example um, from start to end, and then we'll look at a couple more examples um, specific to the philanthropic sector. So what we've plotted here are melanoma rates, so the incidences per 100,000 people of a melanoma. And this is what it looks like when you plot the data in Excel. So we have three series here. The green is Australia, the blue is the United States, and then red at the bottom here is the UK. And then our, our x-axis is time, and our y-axis is melanoma incidence rates per 100,000 people. And let's say that the main point we want to make is how high the melanoma rates in Australia are compared to the other two locations. So again, our, our starting point is Excel defaults when I graph the data using my Mac. 
uh, I typically find it easiest to start by stripping out the stuff that doesn't need to be there um, and then figuring out how we want to look at some things. So, so let's start stripping things out. So let's remove the borders and the grid lines. Let's clean up the axes. So here I, I removed trailing zeros from our x or excuse me, our y axis. On our x axis, we don't need to label every da single data point. So I've done just the endpoints. Now that we've stripped away some of the clutter, we can look more closely at the actual data. And it's looking a little more complicated than needed. So, and also note that we have time on our x-axis. So let's see what this looks like in a line graph. There's that. Um, Excel reintroduces some clutter here with all of the point markers. So I'm going to strip those back out. And I want to avoid the reader having to go back and forth between the legend and the line. So I'm going to label the points directly. And again, I typically do this on the left. Left, um, just because it ensures the reader encounters it, the labels before they get to the actual data as their eyes are scanning from left to right across the page. Um, let's now add some text. So I added a title, axis labels, a source note down at the bottom to make it clear what we're looking at. Um, visually, we could stop here with this graph. It, it looks clean, it's straightforward to read, it's a good point to stop and think about the story that we want to tell. So when I look at it currently, first I encounter the Australia line, then the US, then the UK. But remember the main point I want to make and want to highlight is how much higher melanoma rates in Australia are versus the other countries. So it might be more powerful to build to that. So let's take a look at what happens if we split this into three graphs. So with this setup, I encounter the UK first, then the USA, which is a little higher, and then Australia, which is like, wow, super high um, in comparison, right? I like this buildup better for the story that I want to tell. In this new version, the colors are no longer necessary, so we can reduce that bit of visual clutter. Um, I, I make everything blue, <laughs> typically. Um, uh, with blue, you don't encounter issues with color blindness um, that you can with red and green. It also prints well in black and white um, and just stands out nicely against gray. Um, I also want to draw attention to the difference in scale between Australia and the other locations. So I can do that by actually truncating the scales of the first two graphs. And note that to make sure you still have an apples to apples comparison across, you need to make sure that the 25s line up um, so that you're not um, unintentionally misleading your audience. So now we're at the point where we can put our story into words. And this is where I end up with this graph. So we have our takeaway at the top, the instance of melanoma case of 100,000. Uh, in Australia, is more than double the UK and the US and is increasing along a super, super trajectory. Note how I've used the pre-attentive attribute of color just in places so that somebody can scan and kind of see what's going on. Everything in the graph is labeled. We've stripped out the visual clutter. And this is where we end up. A couple things to keep in mind. Great design takes time. It doesn't typically happen the first time. Plan to iterate. And what I find is this step is often rushed, but that can be damaging because the visual is what others see of all of the other work that's been done. So you don't want to undervalue this part of the analytical process. So let's do a quick recap of where we've been so far. So we've talked through the four main lessons that I wanted to go through today, talked about different types of graphs and use cases for each, identifying and eliminating clutter, focusing attention where you want it with pre-attentive attributes, and using words to tell a visual story or help tell a visual story. So now I want to look at a couple more examples uh, of applications in philanthropy. Um, so we have two kind of quick makeover examples that I found uh, on websites of European foundations. And then we have one that we'll go through in a little more in-depth that's uh, a case study from the Ford Foundation here in New York. So here is the first graph. So this is an overview of, of grant making. And we can see the grants by purpose of funding plotted there with the pie chart. So my thought process as I look through this graph is, first off, it's pretty, right? And it's exceptionally rare that I would say that about a pie chart. <laughs> um, but this graph is really visually nice. 
Um, but as I start to look at it more closely, I see that there's some redundant information. We have percents shown at the top, we have them in the pie itself, we have the pie being labeled. Um, so, so we can probably strip out some of that redundancy and reduce the visual clutter. In the pie chart itself, it's difficult to tell apart the shades of yellow. And I also find myself having to go back and forth between the legend and the pie to figure out what I'm looking at. Um, and then finally, I want to give it an action title. The, the slide title is the first thing that people encounter um, when they see your slide. Um, so you want to make good use of that space. And, and oftentimes what I'll use that space for is the main takeaway. So here's how one way to um, rework this visual. So first off, we've got our action title, right? 67% of funds are spent on running costs and salaries. And now what we've done is organize this as a horizontal bar chart, which allows us to label our different, um, our different segments explicitly. Um, we've got the numbers there, both um, pounds and percent of total, and the visual comparison um, so that the recognition from the audience of where they should focus their attention, kind of what the um, incremental size of the different pieces are, is very quickly visually apparent. So next is achievement against targets. Um, so we've got a table here um, that shows the targets for 2010 and 2011 across a number of different dimensions and where the actuals came in. And mostly what I want to do with this is make it visual, right? As we talked about tables, you have to read. So I pretty much have to read everything and kind of scan down the actual column versus the targets to understand what I'm looking at and to take the information in. I also want this to, I want to tell a story a little bit more with the information that's here. And again, put an action title at the top. So here's what one makeover of this data could look like. So we've got our action title at the top, City Bridge Trust exceeded all targets in 2010-2011. We've got some space at the top where we can use words to tell our story. And now what we've done is actually plotted the targets in gray here, and then the actuals. So it's very quick to see that you've got this delta between the targets and the actuals in all cases where targets are being exceeded. And with all of these, this isn't the right way to look at, um, at the information. It's, it's one idea, right? Everybody will have a slightly different approach. And I think that's one of the reasons that data visualization is appealing for me, is, is that in addition to there being science behind it, there, there's also art, uh, a bit of a creative license. You just want to make sure that you're using that creative license to make the information easier for your audience to get at, not more difficult. So I want to do a quick recap, and then we've got a few minutes to tackle questions. So we've covered a lot <laughs> in the last uh, 45 minutes or so. We started off talking about different types of charts and graphs and use cases for each, using simple text to highlight a single number or two, being cautious about our use of pie charts, using line charts for continuous data, bar charts for categorical data and basically letting the relationship you want to show guide the type of chart you choose. In the second section, we talked about the Gestalt principles and being able to identify and hopefully start to feel more comfortable eliminating clutter from our graphs. It makes the data stand out so much more. In the third section, we talked about how people see and how you can use that to your advantage, specifically with the power of pre-attentive attributes in designing your visuals. So remember, we want to use pre-attentive attributes to both draw our audience's attention to where we want it and to create a visual hierarchy of information. In the fourth section, we talked about using words to build a story around our visualization. And then finally, we looked at some specific examples and applying these lessons in the philanthropic sector. And really practice is the way to get good at this and seeking feedback from your colleagues along the way. So that's what I had to cover today. I'll point you to a couple resources. Um, one, my blog, which is at www.storytellingwithdata.com. 
You can also follow me on Twitter at Story with Data. And now I'll pass it back over to Stephanie um, to see if we have any questions. Great, Cole. Thank you so much. As you said, it really is a bit of science and a bit of art. So thank you for taking us through that and showing us those visual makeovers. That really illustrates your points very well. And Cole, you can just <coughs> You can just go to that big blue button on the upper right to change presenter. Wonderful. Okay, everyone, we do have some time for questions now, and some of you have already typed those in the question pane. So, Cole, one of our first ones is... Do you know about any available open source programs that can be used to generate map solutions for summar summarizing global grant programs? I think one that was mentioned was Many Eyes. Are you familiar with any of yeah. those? So Many Eyes is one um, that IBM, um, I believe, um, puts out. Um, another one that I'm aware of is Tableau. Um, so Tableau is data visualization software. They actually offer something called Tableau Public um, that can be used um, and downloaded for free um, and can be pretty powerful. It actually, it, um, unlike a lot of other graphing software, they've built in kind of some of the, the, the pre-attentive attributes and things that we've talked about, which makes um, makes getting from your starting point to a visual that you want to share a, a little bit of a quicker process. Um, Google also has tools um, that I would encourage you to explore. Um, there is um, mapping capability. Um, there are a lot of different APIs um, that can be leveraged. And if anyone has specific um, questions, um, they can feel free to email me and I can um, provide a little bit more information there. Okay, great, thank you. And another question, would you assign this work to graphic designers or to more of the journalist type? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so, I, it, it depends, right? Um, so, my initial... <laughs> My initial inclination is that it, you know it should be an analyst that's that's um, that's going to be the one who knows the data well enough to be able to um, interpret it, help interpret it for an audience, and um, display it. Um, so it's almost bringing design principles to your analytics group or your your um, your, your people who are doing analytics, and um, because it's not often something that's taught as part of that. Um, Yes, I mean, I think it comes down to who you have in your organization that has the capabilities or, you know, which capabilities are missing and what's easiest to teach. Um, and I think the design principles are, I think it's easier to teach design principles to an analyst than to teach analytics to a designer, if that makes right. sense. Right. <laughs> good, good. And what about using pictures, using photos and that kind of thing? Yeah, pictures can be really powerful for evoking emotion. Um, what you want to make sure is that they are relevant, um, that they aren't kind of cutesy, um, because you know, like Photoshop and um, the cartoon sort of things can actually undercut your message and um, make it feel less credible. So you just want to make sure when you're using pictures that you're using them sparingly and in cases where you've got a, a particular emotion that you want to invoke and, and making sure that your picture is doing that. Okay, great. And someone else was asking about having two types of PowerPoint presentations. If you would advise doing that, so maybe one with less data and then um, more that's more visual that you would show and then one with more data that you would use as a handout. Yeah, so that's always a challenge, um, right? Because what you want to show, um, you, you want less information when you're actually able there to talk through it. 
Um, but when you want to be able to hand out something to someone, you want it to have all the information there. One way to get at it in a single presentation is to have the main presentation be relatively high level, um, but then direct um, your audience to materials that are in the appendix um, for more detailed information. Um, you know, it's almost like having two presentations, but they're kind of integrated together so that you don't run the risk of one um, floating around without all the information in it. But that, that's a constant challenge of how do you provide enough information without overwhelming, and especially given that you know, we're often pressed for time and often it's a single presentation that ends up trying to meet all needs. Um, if you have time for two presentations and can do that, that's fantastic and right. that's ideal. I think a lot of the time we run into time constraints for that. Very good. Okay, one last question. Um, besides reading left to right versus right to left, are there other cultural differences to take into account when presenting to global audiences? Yeah, a great question. Um, color is something else to keep in mind. Different colors have different connotations in different regions. Um, so you just want to keep that in mind when you're designing your visuals. Um, I'm thinking if there are others off the top of my head. Honestly, the audience today is probably um, better suited at answering um, that question than I am. Um, yeah, so uh, how people interpret information across the page is one way. Color would be something else just to keep in mind. I'm going to have to think about that question a little bit more to figure out if there are other things. Those are, those are the two that come off the top of my head. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. And for those of you, if you do have other questions that come to mind, here is Cole has shared her email address, and you can also visit her website, storytellingwithdata.com. So a little bit about TechSoup, if you're wondering, we are a nonprofit organization, and we help support other nonprofits with technology and one of the ways that we do that is through a technology donation program. So we've helped nonprofit recipients save more than 1.8 billion in IT expenses in 33 countries around the world and our mission is really just working towards the day when every nonprofit library and social benefit organization on the planet has the technology knowledge and resources they need to operate at their full potential. So just in closing, we'd like to really thank the EFC for partnering on this program and also thank our webinar sponsor, Citrus, for their donation of this software platform for us to use today. And thank you, thank you so much to Cole again for being here with us today and sharing so much to help our organizations present our data in a better way. And thank you all for joining us here today. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to recording of this presentation. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining. Thanks, Stephanie, for, and Kyla for organizing. Great, thank you.